Welcome to Ready Layer 2 with me, Git. Small. This is a podcast for the founders, innovators, and experimenters building the future of Web3 on Arbitrum. Welcome to the Ready Layer 2 podcast. We're coming at you live on Sanko TV. And if you listen to this after the fact on the edited finished channels like YouTube or the other audio channels, highly encourage you to check out Sanko TV. Really unique application in the Arbitrum ecosystem. And I'm talking with Waffle from Lodestar Finance. Waffle, welcome to the show. Hey, good. Thanks for having me, man. I'm very happy yeah, to man. be here with you. Absolutely. It's been in the works for a little while. Appreciate your patience and getting this set up, but I'm happy to have you here. And I'm really excited to dive into Lodestar Finance. If you will, just introduce yourself, your background. How did you get into the space and what's your area of expertise? For sure. So I'm Waffle. I'm in charge of growth at Lodestar Finance. I got in the industry, I think, around 2015, 2016, at the end of my studies, getting interested mainly around Bitcoin up to today. I'm very much interested in its monetary proper properties, but also very much of a DeFi enthusiast. I come from a background in the commodity inspection industry. I've been traveling a little bit here and there for my job. And I really believe that DeFi can bring financial tools to those who, who don't have access to it. I've been working with farmers in Ivory Coast, in Vietnam, and these farmers, they're producing my commodities, but they really don't have access to all these financial tools that our farmers in the West and in developed countries have. And I believe that DeFi is slowly starting to build the building blocks that would bring these tools to, to the masses. So yeah, as I was saying, very interested into DeFi. I've been very active last cycle on Ethereum, but also on the, on Cosmos, where I got lost also in the privacy aspect. I was very active on Secret Network. This is a private layer one with the private smart contracts, which enable also new use cases. But still, after the Luna collapse, uh, I just wanted to get back to pure DeFi that we were seeing on Ethereum. And I ended up on Arbitrum. I was always interested in options, so I was hanging around to the DOPEX ecosystem just become strike now. And yeah, then I met the Lotstar team. It was the uh, same as me, passionate, DeFi passionate. I wanted to launch an Arbitrum dedicated lending market. So I just offered my service, told them, listen, you guys are devs. If you want me to just help you with the marketing, the business development and the implementation of the protocol in the ecosystem, I'd be very willing to. And you actually became friends. And since then, it's been a very interesting adventure. It's been like for a year and a half now, I'd say. Very nice. How far but, into uh, it yeah, were they to... at that point when you met them? Were they, did they already have something built or were they still at the idea stage? Oh, well, things were being built. It was right before the pre-sale. Oh, what okay. they wanted to do is just, they wanted to do a community owned, funded and directed protocol. So it was just a small public sale capped per wallet. I think it was only $2,000 per wallet participation. So we didn't want to do something very big, but we wanted to do something that was very community oriented. So we actually did a pre-sale, the race, the weekend of the FTX collapse. So it's very nice. rough when it came to the amount we raised. <laughs> yeah, like timing-wise, that was like, <laughs> wasn't the best. But still no. we hung there and uh, yeah. we bought lots of finance to Arbitrum. So what we wanted was just an Arbitrum-oriented lending market. And for those who are listening, the lending market meaning you can deposit a collateral, earn some interest uh, and incentives, and you can borrow against that collateral to build some strategies, but I'm sure we'll be able to jump into those details. Yeah, yeah, right on. No, it's definitely, I want to dig into all of that. It's an area that until recently I hadn't dug into, hadn't tried out, hadn't really experienced much of it, but there's some really interesting strategies you can implement this way with basically like effectively doing like pairs trading and longing long ETH versus Bitcoin and, and things like that. And I want to talk about some of those strategies that somebody could use the platform for. Before we get into that too much, just a little bit more on this, the startup aspect here. How big was that team when, you know, the Lodestar team, when you joined it, how many people were, how many devs were there? How many people were involved? Yeah. So when I joined, there were three people, one lead, the brain behind the project Quanta. And then we had the two, two devs, full stack, Apple and Coops. We then were joined by Sushi who was the front end dev. So it was a small team that came, all came from the Arbitrum community. Okay. And started, we started slowly growing and to the point where we are now. So I would say we are two non-devs and three devs. Okay. Sometimes so small, when you yeah, need some, small some, team yeah, yeah, to get things rolling. That's a small team, small funded, just trying to bring, I think, a very important primitive for a DeFi ecosystem. We obviously have the big boys on Arbitrum speaking about the Aave compound. 
But what we wanted was really something that was Arbitrum with Arbitrum assets and targeting Arbitrum communities. Gotcha. Very cool. And how, like, what was the reception of that when you guys launched, came out a smaller project, competing against some of those at least well-known protocols that have been out there on all the other chains and also on Arbitrum? What was the response from the Arbitrum community? I mean, things have been going pretty well for us. We obviously have the blue chip assets, Bitcoin, ETH, the stable coins. We slowly started integrating Arbitrum native assets. So you have like the big boys at GMX, they can leverage their tokens. Not so. We had DPX. Then we, whenever the, Ar the ARB uh, airdrop happened, we listed also ARB. Mm -hmm. We were very close with the Plutus people. So we also integrated their GLP wrapper, which is an excellent collateral to leverage. So yeah, that orientation, just being from the Arbitrum communities and dedicated to the Arbitrum communities had a pretty good reception. Right. So we we were live, I think, started in, in April. TVL did well, and you can also jump on to that when it comes to staking. We also have some unique mechanics when it comes to our token that were built from scratch, but are also happy to jump on that because it brings some kind of flavor to a lending market that are kind of unique. Who's your primary audience that you're trying to serve? I think two kinds of audiences. The first one is obviously Arbitrum users and Arbitrum token holders who are looking to build strategies through those tokens. On the lending market, such as lots or finance, you can deposit an asset, borrow against it another asset. So if you just want to leverage your position, it's easy. You just, for example, deposit your ARP tokens, borrow some USDC, buy some more ARP tokens on top of that. So you have some kind of leverage on top of that. But we're also targeting protocols who would like to build some automated strategies. We've seen, for example, Harvest Finance, who are, have built on top of some vaults who are looping the assets, for example, borrowing USDC, depositing USDC, or so borrowing more USDC and looping it this way to earn some extra incentives. Okay. And what they've been doing is actually staking our token to earn real yield. So that's the kind of uniqueness for a protocol is that whenever you receive you, whenever you deposit a collateral or borrow another asset, not only you're receiving interest or paying it, but you also get some load incentives, which is our token. Yeah. And the mechanics of, of the load tokens are kind of unique, built from scratch. So you can stake your token, earn a real, a real yield from the protocol. The protocol generates revenue from the borrow side. So if you're paying, for example, interest on your USDC borrow, a share of that interest, instead of going to the lender, is going to the protocol. So we distribute that, that revenues as like on the form of ETH, but the, the uniqueness comes from the option of, the option of locking your tokens. So you can lock your tokens if you want for three or six months and you actually earn a staking boost. So if you lock for three months, you get a 40% staking boost. So you earn more ETH. Then if you lock for six months, you get actually a hundred percent. So you're earning the double. And not only you're earning the real yield when you're locking, boost the real yield when you're locking the tokens, but you actually have access to our emission gauge, which is also very unique in the lending market. An emission gauge, you've seen that on the curve, on a velodrome. What happens is like stakers can decide and direct the incentives to the markets they want on the DEX. So if you're providing liquidity to USDC, USDT, you can direct more incentives. In our case, for the first time, you've integrated these mechanics on the lending market. So if, for example, you leverage your Ethereum on Luster Finance, as a load locker, it makes sense for you to direct the incentives to the ETH deposits and the USDC borrows. So your whole strategy is cheaper. Okay. And this has had some kind of interesting mechanics. We've seen, for example, a lot of incentives, so votes in our emission gauge going for to the ARP token. Every week, we've seen people voting and directing those load tokens over there. And also for the first time, like we've been collaborating with the ecosystem and we reached out to the redacted cartel people because that what they built a bribe system called Hid Hidden Hand, where you can actually bribe token holders to direct incentives. And up to now, mm -hmm. they were doing it only for DEXs, a curve, balancer, but they integrated also a lot of stuff. So we've seen some interesting dynamics on that aspect. We've seen bribes being deposited to direct incentives to, to write Bitcoin. And recently also we have someone who is bribing pretty heavily the USDC borrows. So I guess it's someone who is leveraging his assets and would like to make it do it for a cheaper, a cheaper cost. 
So this That's has really enabled some uh, some unique mechanics that we didn't see anywhere else on the lending market. Yeah, yeah. I, I, basically, there's like layers and layers to the strategies that you can put in there. It sounds just to make sure I want to recap what you described from the, the protocol that was lending mm -hmm. USDC, then they were collateralizing it so they could borrow USDC back out. And then they were using mm -hmm. that borrowed USDC to purchase load, and then they were staking it. Is that right? Those were the, no. They were they were keeping the incentives and staking it to boost that strategy with the real yield of the load token. Got it. Got instead it. of dump, instead of dumping it, yeah, they're staking it just yep. to boost. So yeah, it's so been been layers of steps. Just, it's interesting. Yeah, that's the whole game of tokenomics, right? It's gamifying your ambitions. Uh, we believe that we found some kind of good balance on that aspect. As a token locker, emissions are happening, but you're also getting paid to direct those emissions on top of the real yield. And as a strategy deployer, it makes sense if you're deploying dozens of, and you've seen big actors deploying big strategies, leveraging. It's very cheap to, to boost your strategy with the hundred, two hundred dollars of, of bribes on hidden hand. And all of a sudden you've boosted your strategy and you're earning more APR on that. That's pretty fascinating. So that's, that's what protocols are doing. I guess individuals could do that exact same thing though, right? That just happens to be their strategy, but anybody who wants to, has some capital they want to invest can go and execute the exact same strategy and have all those same benefits too. Not clear if it's an individual or, for, or, or a protocol who's bribing, especially on that USDC that's been happening these last two weeks. It's been an interesting surprise. I didn't track much the world. I kind of even <laughs> don't want to dig too much into it, but it's kind of interesting to see those dynamics okay. happening on a lending market because we've seen it on the decks and we've seen like the curve wars being all built on top of curve and aerodrome and velodrome doing great on that aspect and integrating the whole layers in their own decks. But in our case, like for the first time on the lending market, we believe it's been a good success and a good showcase of the uniqueness of Lodstar. Very nice. So like stepping back to the simpler use cases, like the simplest thing someone could do is if they're just sitting on some USDC and they want to earn interest on it, right? Like you're the, you guys have a decent rate in terms of just that lending. And so if someone wants to come in and just park their USDC, what do they get from you on that in terms of uh, percentage? Let me check right now. We usually do every week a rate recap that we share okay. on Twitter. So if anyone listening just want to give us a follow. But at the moment, if you have some USDC sleeping on your on your wallet, they're earning 19.7%. Yeah, so uh, that's not bad as a simple park. It's not really bad as a simple park. And actually, if we have an, an in-house looping function. So if the person wants just to loop that thing by depositing USDC, borrowing more USDC and depositing it again, they can do it with our in-house looper also. Easier strategy would be that. But then, for example, the strategy that I use myself, I leverage my assets, especially in a bull run. Obviously, none of this is a financial advice. If you have any question bef before doing anything stupid, we're all available on Discord. So come, <laughs> come discuss your it does strategy. Sound like on, a, on does Discord. sound like something I could screw up if I uh, <laughs> hit in there and start looping stuff. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> like we're here to help on Discord if you're new to all this. But for example, I'm a big wrapped Bitcoin holder, what I do is just like, I deposit the wrapped Bitcoin, earn some interest on in that, borrow some USDC without going too leveraged because this is a volatile market. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get liquidated. Sure. But if, I don't know, throwing numbers, if you have deposited 10,000 USDC, USD of Bitcoin in a bull run, it's okay to borrow $3,000 and leverage yourself while being careful and knowing what you're doing. And this is one of the easiest strategy someone can do just like levering, leveraging their positions. Especially with arbitrum assets, if you have some GMX, some Pendle, some ARP tokens, it's usually very profitable to do it on, on Lost Star Finance. And then you have a most advanced strategy, and it's like the Delta neutral ones. Especially with PLV, GLP, we've seen some interesting behaviors on that aspect. For those who don't know, PLV, GLP is a wrapper of GLP. And GLP is some kind, what I call an index of Bitcoin and ETH. So it's 50% yeah. stable, 30% ETH. 20% Bitcoin, right? So imagine you deposit $1,000 of PLV GLP. So if you short that PLV GLP with ETH and Bitcoin at that ratio, so you borrow 30% of the value of your PLV GLP in ETH and mint more PLV GLP with it, okay. and take 20% of the value in Bitcoin and mint more PLV GLP, all of a sudden, your whole position is going to be some kind of stable. 
right? Because if the content of the GLP, of the index of wrapped Bitcoin in ETH pumps, at the same moment you're short, yep. is also getting more negative. So you're staying in what we call a delta neutral position. Yep. And you're actually earning that, you're earning that GLP yield. Yep. That makes for perfect free, sense. Without yeah. counting the interest. So the, pur the purpose of doing all that is now you can take advantage of these incentives. You can take, you, you can be earning the yield on the lended stuff, but you're like, you said, you're delta neutral. So you're not going to get liquidated unless something really weird yeah. happens. I, don't, I can't even think of a scenario, but something really weird would have to happen for you to get liquidated. So your money's safe there. Obviously you always have contract risk like you do with any platform, but otherwise mm -hmm. it's safe and you are earning some yield and you're taking advantage of any incentives that are going on too on the platform. You guys always have your standard incentives, but you guys recently, I don't know if you're, are you still doing ARB incentives from the STIP as well? No, the STIP ended, I think it was two weeks ago. It was definitely a huge success for us on many aspects. We used 95% of those incentives to just incentivize market participants very equally. Whoever deposits on whatever market or borrows, they were receiving incentives at the same value, I would say, same APR. Mm -hmm. But we also wanted to incentivize our emission gauge. So this introduced Arbitrum to, to our gauge. So whoever was participating and voting to direct the incentives, the load incentives was also receiving ARP tokens. Yeah, very cool. And you guys, you said very successful. So did you see an uptick in unique users or unique wallets or TVL? What was the outcome that you all witnessed from that? It was on three aspects. I would say TVL obviously grew a lot of people, a lot of liquidity was dragged to our unique users. A lot of users also introduced to, to lot store because we were going some kind of like small outsiders who got a lot of support from the DAO. I think we ranked six when it comes to vote, to votes in favor of our proposal. Oh, nice. So that was some kind of, yeah, that was some kind of consecration for us, man. It was a real blessing as a small project that was community funded to, to receive that much support. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and on, and on the third aspect, I would say, yeah, I think it, the success came also from the emission gauge. We've seen the number of low tokens being locked to participate in it growing tremendously. I think now we have 55% that is staked and locked on our protocol so it's been great i know there's a second program coming up now it's called the step bridge for the protocols who were in the first step batch yep we're following we're following the development on that and it'll be also applying to it so have you seen any drawback in the last two weeks since the program ended or has it stayed pretty steady we've seen a drawback like the whole arbitrum because yeah i would uh, expect yeah yeah, uh, yeah. it was obvious Obviously, what's going to happen, the way it, it stopped all of a sudden, when you look at most of the protocols who were receiving the ARB incentives, like, obviously, like liquidity is mercenary. So if you stop giving it incentives, it will just go somewhere else to find a, real, a better yield. Yep. No, I totally feel that. But hopefully, like you said, you've introduced a whole bunch of people to the platform through that. You got them in there. You got them trying it. You got them understanding what they could do with it. And hopefully some of those people are sticking around, if not, not the same numbers. And they know when they know to come back when they need that strategy, need to implement one of those strategies. So definitely a win for you guys in the ecosystem too. I'm a big fan of those programs and yeah, I hope they do get the bridge going. There's a long-term incentive program in the works. So a lot of stuff coming. I hope they keep that up. With the whole new layer twos that are popping from everywhere and incentives program for everywhere. I really think that Arbitrum needs to keep going and pushing on these incentives and especially graphs, but also with a lot of introspection. So I think all protocols were ready to do better from one program to another. So we can always just look back at the data and just try to improve the methods of distribution and just to make it even more stickier when it comes to liquidity. But uh, with all these layer two poppings, like we must not stop just to keep the lead when it comes to not only innovation, because that's where I think, I think Arbitrum is really the extension of Ethereum mainnet when it comes to DeFi innovation, mm -hmm. but also to liquidity, because you can innovate as much as you want. If you don't have the liquidity, then it's going to be very hard to keep the lead. Yeah, absolutely. Now, like you, you just touched on something I think is incredibly important is that that measured improvement over time. And when we roll out these programs and incentives and things like that, to make sure that you are actually doing it effectively as an ecosystem, you got to be looking at good outcomes measures, measuring them, reporting back on them. So what were the things like when you think back to your step application and then that program, what were the things that you all promised to report back on? Well, not everything, but what were a few of the key measures? 
there were key metrics were like obviously TVL users, and then it was about retention. I would say. Okay. Retention, I think, unfortunately, everyone failed on it. Like when you look at the TVL on Arbitrum in ETH, I would say like it's been going also down since the end of the steps. But I think we all missed a little bit on that aspect. But when it came to user count, like we have also a June dashboard if anyone wants to have a look. And we definitely see like the user users going very much up when, when the step started. And I think that was a great success. Our distribution method was also interesting. It wasn't like arb dripping per block. What we did, it was just two random snapshots during the week and randomize through a script. It was a great way to get rid of mercenary farmers. So if you want to get mm, your incentives, okay. you got to be ready to park your liquidity for at least one week sure. and be into the snapshots that were average. Yeah, that's smart. And I think that, that was really nice. At the beginning, a lot of confusion. So you, you, had, you had people just coming and, where are my incentives? Yeah. Just wait for <laughs> just a Sunday evening, everyone who received the incentives and you're like, Behind the scene, just trying to running all those scripts and airdropping to everyone through the multisig was also very interesting. But it created some kind of sticky liquidity for our protocol. So that was great, a great success. Yeah, it makes it a little bit more exciting for the end user too, because it's on a, they're going to have to wait and then it'll be a nice surprise. But yeah, oh, yeah. kind of to there are some complaints. Okay, no, that's cool. So what did you, like in this process, either through applying for that grant getting approved for it, executing on it. Like what were the big lessons for you guys? What did you learn? What surprised you about the whole process? I mean, on my side, it was a lot of BD work, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We're very small. We don't have a lot. Of, we, we unfortunately didn't receive the ARB airdrop for the DAOs. So we don't have much voting power on the DAO. Yep. So on my end, it was like days and weeks reaching out to all the delegates. They were very lovely and very well welcoming when it comes to us. So it was okay. like explaining what we were doing, like, and it was a lot of work, but thanks, thanks God, they're very supportive to that. And like the, again, the massive amount of support we received, just like, we couldn't believe it. Like when you ranked six, it was like, okay, it was a, a lot of work trying to convince the delegates, mm -hmm. but in the end, it was very much worth it. Worth it on the financial aspect for our protocol and our DAO, because we received a very interesting, we, I think we received 750,000 ARP tokens, Okay, but also it was also yeah, it felt good, man. It felt just like yeah, Arbitrum was accepting us. Like the small ones, small outsiders, we were sitting at the big boys' table. It was great. Yeah. So did you feel like it gave you the ability to go and talk with all those folks? Like you had a reason to talk with them that maybe you, you wouldn't have otherwise. So to reach out to the big delegates and all of that, was it hard to get a hold of people or was, were they basically raring to go and dig into this stuff? I don't know. Most of them saw me around. Like I've been on Arbitrum since, since the early days, so they knew me. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they were also reachable. But there was also a lot of uncertainties. People didn't really know how to approach this these votes for the protocols. It was, I think, for delegates, it was also a lot of work. I yeah, a lot honest. of work, a lot of responsibility too. Exactly. So yeah. I understand that some of them were a little bit like at the beginning, a bit reluctant and they're telling me, oh yeah, let's see in a few days and yep. see how things go. Yep. But I'm also like some kind of pushy guy, like on the, on the DMs well, you gotta every be. day. Yeah, like, BD, you gotta be, right? <laughs> you gotta be, right? Yep. But yeah, in the end, like it all ended well. It also felt good to see, we don't say competitors because we're not competing with either Radiant or Silo. This is different protocols, but seeing them also supporting us as small, a small lending market and voting yes for us was also some kind of blessing so again yeah, that's pretty if cool. any of them are listening it's thank you because uh, it definitely felt good for us yeah that's right there that's a community vote right if you're voting for someone that's offering a similar service to you within the same ecosystem you're doing so because you think it's better for the ecosystem which not everyone thinks that way so yeah good on them for lending you that I'm, support for sure i mean the, the sentence that was going around is high tides raise all the boats exactly that's the sentence, yep right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and it definitely seemed so, like that was the attitude for the most part, I think, of folks during that time. And I did. I thought a lot about the large delegates and the responsibility that they have to look at. Because there was 100 plus applications. I can't remember the numbers, but there's oh, a lot God. of applications. These are complicated things. And we all don't know everything about all of the different areas of Arbitrum, even the people that are active all day long, every day. Like you get focused in on stuff that you're interested in, you get expert in that, but you're not expert in everything. Those are not paid positions, right? Those are just basically volunteers doing that work and have that, you know, they obviously made the decision to become a delegate and take on the responsibility, but it's a lot to ask them and it was in a short time frame too. So I was curious what that process was like, because you weren't the only one that was tracking them down. So I could see some being, well, I imagine. so, all right, interesting.
So what would you do differently next time? Or maybe perhaps another way to ask the question would be, what would you recommend to someone who hasn't been through this? If another program, another grant program like that comes around, what would you recommend to another founder or BD person out there in terms of approaching it? I think it's about being not only honest, but also not afraid of reaching out. I think we're all passionate. That's, that, I think that's why I left my industry for to this one. It's Everyone in this industry is passionate about it. So if you manage to pass your message and explain what you want to do for, with your step and how you want to bring something positive to the ecosystem, I think most of the delegates are just looking for the same, same objectives, right? Mm -hmm. Just improve, arbitrum, and keep le leading. And the fact that for the new program, the long-term incentives, LTIP one, and also the bridge, they also brought some advisors, delegate advisors. I think there's Jojo, Castle Capital, and the third one, I don't, I think it's Seed Latin. They are advising applicants. And this is oh, also nice. very helpful Yeah, because as a first as participant of the first step, I remember during the first days of the application, no one wanted to pause their application because no one knew how to do it. So yeah. we were all just looking at the forum, waiting for the first one to do it. So we know how to approach it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, you so know, who was the first? Do you remember yeah, who you, was the first to post? I think, was it Dopex? I think so. I think it, it was Dopex. I'm not sure. Okay. But I know enough. they were very inspirational. In our case, like we booked on the own hours, but you, I was just, I didn't want to go first. I was like, I'm. First of all, we're a small protocol. <laughs> and so you don't want to fuck up. You don't want to be the first one. Yeah. Up. <laughs> no, no. Grants, grants could be intimidating for sure. But the, the fact they're bringing advisors now who are very much DeFi passionate. That's smart. They know our Bitrum. They know the delegates. It's very small. Well, that's but good for I everybody. Enjoy, right? That's good for you guys writing the applications, but it's good for the delegates who are getting them too, right? If you help the writers write better applications, that's going to make the job of the delegates easier to to compare things, especially and think about them in the context of the program and the goals, right? Because the grant has specific goals, so they need to be able to read your application and understand how your application impacts those goals and drives those goals and measures. Even if they love your platform, if what you're suggesting doesn't isn't the best way to approach the goals, then they need to be able to understand that. No, I think it's, a, it's definitely a great addition to the whole grant process. I believe that they'll be implied, involved into the step bridge. So we started working on our application. We're just waiting for the whole process to go through. But I'm also looking very much forward to their input and see how they would do it better. Yeah. And for us, obviously, to follow their their recommendations. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that's all good news to me, man. That makes me really happy. Like, we are we just came up. I think we just passed the one-year anniversary of the creation of the DAO. So I know that's a long time in the space, but it's only a year. And we've come a long way, and we've gotten through these, a big program like that learn from it. They're, they're, the DAO's adjusting. It's just, it's really good to see. So that, that, that makes me really happy. So changing gears here a little bit, if you look back, I think you said you went live in like fall of 22. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So fall, fall of 22. 22. So you're coming up on, you know, you're 18 months into it and everyone has their challenges, right? So you guys got started. What would you say would have been the big challenges or big things that you've had to deal with along the way, either individually or as a team? to get to the point where you are now? I'd say the challenges were, we launched at the end of 2022. We unfortunately got exploited a few weeks after launch. Okay. So the, ch the challenge was bringing back the protocol to life in a few aspects. First one was the security one. It was about like auditing the protocol. Since then, we've been auditing it three times, putting bug bounties to just to have white hats looking at it mm -hmm. and building back the trust. So that was a kind of a very much of a challenge for us. Yeah, I imagine um, just thanks, a few weeks. And I, I did read about the exploit, but I didn't realize it was that close to launch, which had to make it even more challenging. Yeah, it was definitely, it was three weeks in. So we were just like, oh, yeah, we just like faced the situation. Do we drop it all? And whoever participated in the pre got tracked and it's over. Or do we just keep pushing it? Because in the end, we were, we came from the Arbitrum community. Our investors, they were small small investors from the Arbitrum community, we had to push it. We used some share from our tokens to compensate the victims. We audited the protocol. So it was with Solidity Finance. We had also a bug bounty program in partnership with the uh, Hats Finance. And we managed to launch back. And 
I think the fact that we managed to do that, it also showed us some kind of, yeah, it just like we managed to build back trust with our users. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was, I think that was the most challenging aspect. And then obviously, yeah, it definitely was. But again, the fact that we're still here, we always owe to the community. We always say that. We started as a community owned project and it will keep going as a community. Like whatever we're doing, it is for, is for our, uh, our friends on Discord who are also very active. Yeah, But then obviously when came the step, that was also very challenging because we felt that we had to also to, to get a grant and keep going and be sitting at a big boys table also. So that was also a big challenge, which we, all, we also managed to go through. But now next step for us would be also to, to keep growing. We also recently released our V2 details. So now we're going to try to take the protocol to the next level. Um, okay. So it's a permanent job, man. It's a... When you go full time in crypto and start building projects, it just become a whole part of your life. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. It just never <laughs> stops. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like it, there's no weekends, there's no nights. There's, but again, this is also what makes it so special. You gotta be passionate to be building. It. It's yeah, yeah, that's that's that it's necessary to do that to push things along to an extent. But also, I think the people that are here tend to just be the people that want that want to be doing that. I spend a lot hmm. of time working on this stuff because just because I'm having so much damn fun. It's not like, I, I don't feel like I'm being forced to pay attention to something. I'm usually like really excited. And if I'm pulled away, it's annoying to me that I can't get back. So uh, I'm, I'm with you on that front for sure. So let's talk about V2. What is, what's coming? Are you guys reworking the platform, add new features? What's the announcement? The announcement is just going to be the expansion of lots. Or we had the V1. So it's built off a combined fork. But like I said, adapted with an emission gauge with some kind of uniqueness we mm. spoke already about. But the V2, we're going to be able to integrate more assets with the different or price oracle sources. So it's going to have a few features. First one is going to be clusters. So you'll have, it's not going to be similar to isolated lending platforms such as Silo, but you'll have, for example, LSD dedicated clusters. So you'll have different LSD, Ethereum LSDs with ETH and USDC that are isolated by themselves just to insulate the risk and for us to be able to list more assets. You can have also ecosystem clusters. So again, isolating the risk between a few assets. And if anything wrong happens with these, it will not impact the actual lot star market. So this will allow us to grow the offer. And this comes also with the new Oracle system. Up to now, we were mainly relying on Chainlink, which is, in our opinion, one of the most reliable oracles that's it's reliable but it also doesn't offer much assets pricing but with our new oracle we'll be also integrating dia redstone so these are different pricing sources for us to list the tokens so okay. this associ- associated with the cluster model it will definitely expand the offer that we can bring to arbitrum okay very um, cool another aspect another aspect is going to be some kind of automated liquidity vault so that vault will be balancing the liquidity itself. So you can deposit to SDC mm, okay. and it will deposit some like 30% in the LSD cluster, 20% in the, let's say the small cap Arbitrum cluster, just for you to spread your USDC on, on the different clusters to, to, to optimize your yield. And then we'll be also adding a few tools. For example, we'll be adding some kind of zapper. So in one click, you can leverage yourself. In one click, you can switch a collateral it's all going to be about tooling. We're also going to add some kind of trading platform built on top of our markets. So instead of going on GMX, opening a leverage, or going on Binance to open a leverage, and usually sometimes it's also very cheaper to do it directly on, on a lending market. So on one click, you can leverage yourself at 10x Ethereum if you want. And okay. behind the scene, what's happening is depositing Ethereum, borrowing USDC, and leveraging 10x. So cool. that's where yeah, we're going. Like yeah, using it's, it's just bringing more tools for DeFi enthusiasts to, to deploy strategies. So this, yeah. the clusters, the new oracles, should definitely expand our offer. Yeah, those one-click zappers definitely make it more accessible to people who don't, who like understand the concept of what they're trying to accomplish, but don't necessarily know how to manage the, the complexity of the platform and weighing everything against each other. So to be able to come in and say, yeah, I just want to 10x long this thing, click it and be done. That's a pretty cool feature. I like that. No, hopefully we'll be also integrating some interesting trading interface also, some charts. We really want, I think the, the DAF team wants to build some kind of trading platform built on top uh, of lots. Recently, we've seen heads up to Contango. They're doing great, great work. They built trading platform on the different lending markets. 
So just wanted to give them a, a shout out. They're doing also very great on that aspect. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely trade on top of our liquidity at Lotstar. But what we want to do is just integrate it with all our clusters and our homemade tools. Okay, very cool. What kind of timeline are you looking at for some of that stuff to start coming to life? Oh man, you know how timelines are in DeFi. If I give, <laughs> if I tell you six months, it's gonna be in one year. Like this, we so, release the details. Uh, we're keeping everyone updated on Discord through Dev updates, but we also like with all our past past release, we've learned something. Like, don't give a timeline to to people because you just want don't want to disappoint. It's gonna be very hard to keep your timeline. So I'd no, say like the devs are asking when when. Exactly. And it's, <laughs> and I get the frustration because in the end you want to do good and tell them, listen, the devs are expecting it in six weeks and yep. then dev work and you'd say it ends up being 12 weeks and people get yep. frustrated. So we yeah, learned our lessons. We just keep, we keep people updated on the development and then they can make a guess themselves. So now the code is, devs are working on the code. It's not gone on the audit, on the audit table yet. So we're keeping everyone. Whenever it goes to the audit table, people can then think themselves about the timeline. Same like during our V1 release, we were being audited by Halborn and Halborn told us, hey, it's going to be ready in one week, one month. So we announced that the community Halborn is announcing in one month. And it ended up lasting for three months and everyone yeah. got very frustrated. I think that happens a lot. So, That's happening on Sanko's L2 chain right now. They said they're ready to go. They're just waiting on the auditors and, and it's out of their hands that's what happened absolutely i would invite everyone just to uh, to join our discord and just follow the dev update channel got it so you guys take the pretty build out in the open approach right but that's what uh, a discussion i've had with a lot of founders on the show is the difference between building out in the open versus disappearing for a while and coming back when features are complete sounds like you guys lean towards the first that building out in the open is that right yeah, I think this is also something the community appreciate with us. We're just fully transparent with them. So we just rather tell them all the truth and without giving any promise or expectation on timelines mm-hmm. and never it's ready. Got it. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so jump on the Discord if you're interested and then following along for sure. We got V2 coming. You guys are hoping for this bridge bridge on the step. There's other set of programs going on. Anything else exciting that you want to share with the listeners before we wrap up here? Oh yeah, I mean, we did the snapshot yesterday. We announced it to the community. There's going to be a second snapshot, but I cannot say why. Ah, okay. <laughs> so a little teaser alpha there. I so like we, that. Yeah, yeah. We're building behind the, the scene. We have a few expansion plans, and so we took snapshot because we want to know who's been with us in this ride. We're going to take a second one, and then we'll see. I would invite everyone to follow the announcements. We're very much excited about this one too. Okay, very cool. Yeah, definitely. I assume Discord is probably the way to do that too. It's all our activity and our DAO and community is happening on Discord. So, gotcha. So that's uh, I really invite at. everyone to to join. Yeah. Okay, very cool. And when this thing publishes, I'll link up. Typically, I just link up the Twitter page and refer people to there. I find, I assume they can find any links they need to your website, to Discord, to get connected with you all there. Absolutely. And if anyone has any question or about either our protocol, our token, or strategies you can build on our protocol, we're all available on our Discord. Very nice. Very nice. And you're you're on X at Waffle Ape. Is that right? Waffle Ape, absolutely. All right. There you go. Awesome, man. This has been a lot of fun. Definitely an area of that I need to learn more in. So I appreciate you coming and spend some time with me today, answering all my questions, sharing with the audience. And it's, I think what you guys are building is really cool. And I think it's a great story too. a small team building up, especially with the early exploit and working through all of that. It's still going strong here a year and a half later. Kudos to you guys. I know it goes into building and anybody who makes it as far as you guys has been through some stuff. Appreciate what you guys bring in the community. Hats off to you on the good work and wish you continued success, man. I appreciate it. Again, thanks very much for having me. Like definitely was a great chat and i hope we can have a next one for the v2 release oh yeah i'd love that absolutely man when it's time i'd love to have you back we'll talk through all of it and then find out what you learn between now and then because i'm sure there'll be plenty of lessons so good stuff and to those of you who tuned in live with us on sanko tv appreciate you and to everybody else thanks as always for joining us and tuning in on youtube or the audio channels we'll see you next time on ready layer two Thank you for listening to Ready Layer 2. If you're an Arbitrum builder with a story to share, then hit me up on Twitter at GitSmall, G-I-T-S-M-O-L. Learn more at GitSmall.com.